All right, well, I'm going to pray, and just uh, I'm glad you're here. We'll continue this uh, series, 12 Habits That Lead to Divorce, and How to Avoid Them. We're all in on that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the word of truth we've already heard this morning, that you meet us right where we are, in the good times and in the challenging times. We pray that even now, Lord, give us ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying, that this truth might not only be imparted into our lives, but the lives of others around us in your name. Amen. Somebody could just pop that door closed. That'd be great. Thank you so much. So the one that, uh, the, the, uh, the next habit that we're going to look at is putting marriage on hold while raising kids. Putting marriage on hold while raising kids. And that happens way too much. Uh, so many, many times we just feel that if we have our children and we get them straight, everything's going to be great. But I tell you, over the years, I can't tell you how many times I have sat with couples who at 20 years married, uh, look at each other and go, like, who are you? You know, without children defining them, older, younger, whatever children, without children defining them, there is nothing there that they have in common anymore. And that's a real, that's a real challenge for sure. There are notes, and they're right on that back table there. Why don't you grab a couple, of, if anybody doesn't have notes, okay? So, again, once again, in the, in the world that we're in today, we're at a place where we are not really paying attention to what's going on. We're sort of skimming our way through so many parts of our life. And so those, the, on the notes there, I, have, I want to keep repeating, we have become a skimming generation. We're not really paying attention. We're not really paying attention to each other in our marriage relationship or in other relationships. We're not really paying attention to the kids. We're just, it's just kind of happening. In the very beginning, uh, when Bradley was... Uh, doing, he, you know, he was like typical, okay, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to do that, I want to do that. And we, being the mean old parents we were, said you can do one thing at the school, which was easy because they only do one thing at a time, and then one extracurricular because we wanted him out in the world as well because he went to school here. And so he had, uh, he chose uh, uh, baseball and, uh, and that worked well. You know, it was something to fill his time. He was not, uh, he was in Smithtown Kickers, you know, the whole routine, one at a time because we didn't want that to control our days and our lives. I literally watched, I was at a uh, baseball game with him and I, and I, I heard a parent went up and back and back and forth with the coach. And then, you know, I guess they made an agreement. And so her son who was playing on the team, uh, the baseball team then had to step behind the stands and put his hockey equipment on so they could leave the baseball game and go to the hockey game. And I'm, and I'm sure that happens many, many times. The challenge is, is that becomes the definition of our marriage, and that's the challenge when our marriage is defined by our children instead of our children being defined by our marriage. When our marriage is defined by our children versus our children being defined by our marriage. Big, big difference. And so the notes here in front of you, I try to just give kind of a big picture in terms of what really matters. And what really matters to you as a couple, I don't care if your kids are older or both our children are married and we have grandchildren or not, it's really about what is your vision as a ma in, in your marriage in light of parenting, in light of the big picture in terms of your marriage and the children or anybody else that's dependent on you at all. It doesn't matter uh, whether, whether you got saved later in the years and you're, you're trying to live a Christian life or you've been saved and you're raising your family within the context of that. The bottom line is where are you going as a couple? That's the most important thing. Where are you going as a couple in your faith with Christ? So Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Where there's no vision, the perishing is on so many different levels. It can be on uh, raising your children. It can be on your finances. It could be in your personal relationship. It could be in everything. It perishes because we have no direction. There's not one person here who's running a company that kind of comes in every day and goes, oh, what do we think we should do today? Well, we got this, this, and this. Yeah, let's do that, that. Uh, hey, let's go get a cup of coffee. That business would last about a week and a half. You know, it's not going to work. But for some reason, we think in our marriages, we don't have to have a vision. Now, I'm talking about a five-year plan, but a, a general con uh, connection together, what's important to us, what matters to us. So many times when couples come in and they're, they're preparing for marriage, I will ask them in, my, in the section I have with them, what is your vision? And you get this like, what? We're getting married. Yeah, that's not the vision. We're having a wedding. That's not the vision. 
What do you want your life to be about after the wedding gifts are open and you've returned the ones you don't want and the other ones are broken? And a year later, where, where are you going? Because it's going to depend upon where you live, what you buy, where you spend your money, all kinds of things, including a family. So the first thing is, you know, first, and from Ephesians 5, I'm not going to go through all of it for the sake of time, but for the, 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 is, is the first thing is, you know, what's, what's your vision for your marriage? That's what matters. I, if, even if it's a second, if it's a blended family, what's your vision for your marriage? That's the first thing, and, and that's what this class and all the things we do here at Smith Tennis are all about when it comes to marriages. Secondly, what is your vision for your children? So your marriage is intact, and in that covering, in that place of protection, then your children. That's where your the vision for what you want your children to see what unfolds in their lives. And then after that is what is your vision for your family, which goes beyond the extended yourselves, the uh, core family, to your extended family. And then after that, of course, there's just other things that, that are added on to that, you know, where your business or, and that type of thing. But the most important thing is that we start with you as a, as a couple in your marriage, And then the children that God has given you, whether they're adopted, whether they're stepchildren, whatever it is, what's our vision realistically for them? And then finally, what's the big, big picture? What's your family all about? And there's certainly times, you know, we come, Phyllis and I grew up in wonderful homes, uh, but they were not saved. So there was a certain point where raising our children, we had to do that, realizing our families were unsaved. Now, we weren't nasty, rude, or disrespectful, but some of the things that defined us growing up as children, we could not bring into our home, not because they were horrible and sinful, but they weren't biblical in terms of the way we were going to raise our children. So there were choices that we had to make. And so when we say, we, when we stop everything and we say, okay, first the children, then the rest of the family follows there, we don't have to say, no, let's make sure we get it in the right order. First, the, us as a couple, where we are, and then what begins to unfold. Now, is it always easy as one, two, three? No, it isn't. It's overlapping, needless to say, many times. But when we get to those crossroads where things are not working and we're fighting as a couple or we're disagreeing or our finances are all over the place, we have to stop and say, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What about us? Because we have to be intact. Studies have shown that children, children that even have gone through divorce, they want their parents together. It's the craziest thing. They will do whatever they can. And so the, even in the early years of a divorce, when, it's, when the couple's just adjusting and the kids, the kids, they say, well, you know, they, 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 the, the uh, parents will say, well, he said that you're doing this. No, no, he said that you're doing this. Yeah, that's because all the kids are trying to do is, is be safe with mom or safe with dad. They don't care. They just want the covering and the safety. God has created children to have a covering and a protection over their lives. You may not be the best parents. You may not have everything perfect. You, you may not have the best marriage, but your children will adjust to whatever you give them. It's so really important that as, we, as that covering is over them, you as a couple, you will impact your children because they want to feel safe. They want to feel safe. Those of you that have uh, been through our divorce care, there's one thing that sticks out in my mind all the time, and I think I've shared it before, and that is they say that a, ch- a child, they, they, these interviews of children that have uh, gone through divorce and kind of reflecting on that, and the one gr- woman goes, one young lady goes, she's probably maybe in her early 20s, she goes, I know this is ridiculous, and I know my parents are never going to get back together again, but I can't help but say, I really wish I could have my parents back together again. But it had been years. There's something in the design of children that want that covering of their protection over their lives. Now, there's all kinds of things that go with it. I get it. But it just helps us understand how important it is for us to have ourselves intact before we let the children define what's going on. And so I took the word vision and just kind of broke it down as an acrostic. Maybe it'll help us remember it. Maybe it'll help me to remember it, too. So how do we do this? How do we establish a place where the children are not first, but you and, and a, as a couple are? Now, first of all, let me tell you right now, as we hear from the message today, is you, 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 you can, tomorrow is the day you start. This afternoon is the day you start. Not like law, but like, okay, we need to let the Holy Spirit reveal to us places where we've messed up. I had one couple, uh, uh, one uh, couple, husband and wife, they have many kids all over, um, trying to think of his, uh, the birds. I forgot, the, do you remember their first names? It was, 
Gary and Terry Bird, thank you. They went through our ancient past and realized that they had just made mistakes. I don't know what they were, but they got in their car literally from Smithtown and drove to every, I think they have five children at least, all married. They went to every single one of them from here through Pennsylvania down to Florida and back and asked forgiveness for not being the blessing and then shared a blessing over their lives. All these kids are married, but it was the beginning to say they were not, they let the kids be the, val, be the directing the vision instead of them, and they had never really blessed their children. Can I, this is not on your notes, but I can encourage you, having, blessing your children is a way of establishing who you are in your marriage relationship. And blessing your children can be as formal as we've had beautiful blessing ceremonies here at the church, which I've been part of. Our daughter had our one, and Bradley, our son, it was just us together. Uh, we were away on vacation, and it's just you speaking words of blessing and truth and hope over your kids. It is the most powerful thing. When everything stops, when our TV's not on, uh, devices on, and you're just together, you know we're here as parents to bless you, your gifts, your abilities. If you, if you want any more information in that, my email's on there, just uh, email and I'll, I'll, I'll update, I'll, I'll get you going on that. Okay, so the first thing is value your spouse. Ephesians 5 spells out the intimate place to connect uh, to your spouse with or without your children. In other words, the love and respect continues to grow. We're all familiar with Ephesians 5. Husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church. Wives respect your husbands. That dynamic, in other words, your children, how do we turn this around? You realize that decisions that you're making with your children with, ha, are, should never be in conflict with the valuing of your spouse. It should never be, well, you know, mom, you know, we'll just, just humor her and just do what she said. You know, dad, you know, we don't want this anger. We don't want that to get in the way. There has to be a place where we, you, no matter what, you choose to value your spouse. Are they always easy to value? I doubt it. I don't think I am all the time. Well, most of the time. But I mean, the idea is you, we need to be able to say, okay, I value you, even if it's just the process of learning. And God does that. God, show me how to value my spouse. Show me how to value them. And the Holy Spirit can give us understanding of how to bring value into their hearts and their lives. Secondly, invest in your big vision of married life. Raising your children to impact the world around you. Just having children is not enough. What we, are want, what we are wanting together to impart into their lives. What do we want? Now, what's the big vision? You know, when we raised our children, our children, you know, they were, they were a part of our life. We weren't a part of their life. Big difference. They were a part of our life, and our life was to serve the Lord. And that meant, yeah, sure, I'm a pastor, so I'm here a lot. We happen to live on the ground, so we have a lot. That doesn't mean, believe me, I have horror stories of PKs, pastor's kids, or missionary kids, MKs, that go way off as prodigals. They go all over the place. So there's no guarantee, but there is a guarantee when we invest in the bigger vision. In other words, always saying, what's the big thing we want our kids to experience? We want, not what they want. Now, sometimes, you know, it gets a tension point. But, and there were certainly moments in our life where what our kids wanted and what we wanted were not the same. Now, they weren't diametrically opposed, but they weren't the same. But you see, when your kids are raised in a place with the things of the Lord, now I'm not talking you have to have church every day in your house, but when your life as a couple is constantly reflecting Christ in forgiveness and discussion and the way we talk, it sets a bigger vision that you can plug your kids into. And they begin to realize, you know, that, that church matters. You know, I know when the pandemic started, we all became very philosophical. Well, the church isn't the building, it's all. I thought, okay, I don't know how long this is going to last. But the fact is, at some point, the church is the building, and it is where, and it is a gathering, just like we're doing here. It's something powerful about gathering together and for your children to know how important that is. So the bigger picture, that helps us not let the children run what's going on. Okay, and then um, stay connected, raising your children, Okay. You will disagree on how to raise your children, guaranteed. You're going to bring your stuff from the past, how you, ra how you were raised. You're going to, uh, the good stuff and the bad stuff. You're not always going to be on the same page in terms of the season you're in and the season your children are in. There's all kinds of things that, that get in the way there. But, you know, Ephesians 6 says, 
honor your mother and father with the promise of a long life. That's from, um, from the uh, uh, Ten Commandments. And then your honoring each other sets an honoring standard, okay? So James 1.19, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. This process allows you to learn and grow in your relationship first, then your reflected parenting choices. In other words, the process is we need, as, so that the children don't decide, we need to connect as parents at how we're going to raise our children. There are some things that Phyllis was raised that were like, wow, that's awesome stuff. Very family, family nights, family this, family that. We I wasn't raised that way. We, we all got together. We went out to dinner every Saturday night. We always went out to dinner Saturday night because my mother said, I'm off on the weekends. And then, and then Sunday, it was takeout, takeout from somewhere. And when mom cooked during the week, we kind of were hoping for the weekend, let's just say. <laughs> Love my mom. Cooking was not her focus, you know. Did a lot of other things, ran things, all kinds of stuff. Fit cooking, not so much. But you see, stay connected. There's got to be places where, first of all, you know neither of you want to hurt your children. I'm not talking physically, or hopefully physically, but I mean, I'm not talking. You all want the best, and you're going to pull from the best of the way that you were raised, and you're going to try to bring that into But sometimes those things aren't the same. You know, we were, I grew up in a very active home. We were always going, coming, going, running things. Phyllis grew up, and I wouldn't call it a passive home, but it, it was just, they were five kids, mom and dad. His her father was a New York City fireman. They did all, they just being together was all, their summer was going in the backyard to the above ground pool. That was their summer. We went away every summer, somewhere. So when we were first married, like, where are we going to go this summer? What do you mean? Well, we're going to go somewhere, right? Because it's vacation, summer, vacation. Then that didn't, that was two different worlds coming together. So when you get to that place is stay connected, talk to one another. We learned so much about each other in our marriage as we learned about how we were both raised, which was completely different, completely different. And that process allows you then, instead of arguing about it, you know, uh, or making determinations. Well, you just want this, or you want that. You don't want to understand. These kids need whatever it is. You have to stop. Um, I gave this example probably a while ago. Uh, Bradley was, I don't know what age he was. I guess the mouth off age. You know that age, whatever age that is, it was the mouth off age. I don't know what that. And uh, he, we were in the den, and he said something to Phyllis, and I was like, what? And I, I still, to this day, can't believe I did this, but I must have been much younger. And, uh, and I got up and went after him, thinking, I have no idea what I'm doing, you know. But I just felt I needed to respond, and I did. And so we have a two, two levels, and he ran upstairs, and I ran up after him, still thinking, what am I going to do when I get up there, you know? But I know I'm, I'm running after him. I got all the way upstairs, and, you know, I didn't hit him or anything. He was too old for that, but I just yelled at him and told him off and whatever. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a biblical, now, honey, I just feel like you were disrespectful to your mother. We need to pray about that, and now you'll be grounded for the rest of your life. You know, it wasn't one of those. It wasn't one of those. It was yelling. It was, it was happening. So I came downstairs, and I thought, oh, now I'm going to have another problem because Phyllis is going to now address the way I addressed it. I just know it. So I came downstairs, and I sat down. I'm thinking, and I got nothing. I thought, okay. I said, I know. I did it all wrong. I did it all wrong. I did everything wrong. I, I know it. But at the time, and, and she just kind of smiled like, yeah. I mean, we, did, we know we did it wrong. I did it wrong. So well, let's just keep going. You know, let's pick up the pieces and keep going. But sometimes, you know, we are... We, did I, is that what I wanted to do on a whatever day or night it was? Of course not. Is that I wanna, how I want to see myself running up the stairs yelling at my son? Of course not. Do I want him mouthing off at his, at his mother? No, I don't want that either. But the point is, is that this is the first time something that ever happened. Well, you know what? I didn't take that class yet. And so together, we were like, okay, so when it all calmed down, it wasn't... See, because what happens is if the child, if he's in charge, then the argument starts in the den. I can't believe you did that. Was, oh, no, no, no. I'm going to go up. I mean, I'm going to bring him a special snack because he likes the snack. And I'm going to go, you know, he's going to be a, you know, he's going to be a drug addict. You know, whatever it is that's going to come from this. Instead, we were able to sit there and go, well, 
that stinks. How do we do that? How do we not do that again? And we talked it through. Not yelling, not, oh, oh, just whatever. You know, it was, con it was a conscious effort to stay connected in a parenting moment that we had never had before. It's easy to connect on the positive ones, right? My mother drives me crazy. You know, she's 91 years old, and that's what you do at 91. And so if somebody's, you know, I was down visiting her when she got her cataract surgery at 91. And so she said, yeah, this is my son. And, uh, you know, and she said, say something. And they said, uh, oh, you're just, I love this at 66 years old. You're just such a nice young man. Say that again. You know, nice young man. Say that again. And my mother will always say, well, you know, he didn't, he didn't come out that way. She always will say that, you know. So it's her response. She, said, she did it, so it's okay right now. But there is a certain point, isn't it interesting? When our kids are great, we're like, yeah, well, you know, we've done the best we can. When they're bad, it's like, well, you know, I tried, but, you know, she, he, you know. We never want to take credit for them being bad. It's never our fault that they're bad. It's always only when they're good. Then we're right in, right in sync with those. So, again, don't let, when it comes to those moments, and you may have them if you're raising children right now, you may have that place and say, okay, here's the places, at least a little extra, no extra charge. If you know, you could probably go home right now and say, here are the places that we come in conflict with with our children. See, because if you don't resolve it, they resolve it by being in charge. So the next time there's a mouth off, who's in charge? Well, if, if I know that not only do we have somebody mouthing off at my wife or my husband, but now I know afterwards, now we're going to be into, you just kind of go, you know, whatever. Just go up to your room. Now we've lost, and our children are in charge. They have now defined how we're going to react to that situation and will not stay the same. It'll only get worse. And so that's why we have, we have to stay to connect. Otherwise, the children become in charge. Secondly, um, initiate marriage moments. Now, I was, Phyllis and I were reading this. He goes, Ted, I can't believe you're putting that in there. I said, well, you know what? We need to see, be serious about marriage moments, not just something that we high-five each other between jobs. You know, it's from the Song of Solomon. You can read that whole thing. You know, how beautiful you are. This is obviously the man speaking to his wife. My darling, how beautiful your eyes uh, uh, behind your veil are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats. Not very exciting, but at that time, yes. Descending on the Mount of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep, just shown. That's good, white, uh, coming up from the washing. Each has a twin. Not one of them is alone. So that means he has a full mouth of teeth. That's a good thing. Your lips are like scarlet ribbon. And your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like halves of pomegranate. I guess that's a good thing. And your neck is like the Tower of David built with elegance. Now, you have to kind of translate that back about a few centuries. And actually, that was all good things. But my point is we have to see we need to stay together and the children want us to stay together and that allows us to be in charge and not them. And you say, what does one have to do with the other? It has everything to do. Here's an interesting thing. If First of all, we all need that. You know, the second one is that words of respect for your husband, encourage him, and especially in parenting and times alone in your marriage give you a vision to grow. We need those times alone. Phyllis and I have always had times alone uh, we've always scheduled that, so to speak, in. But the, the key here is if you don't, if you don't have that, and this is particularly, I have to say, for men, for the women, if that's not there, the women will naturally get that during the nurturing years of from zero to age 12 um, from their children. And that's what happens when, when moms or the, your wife is more connected to the children than you because there's been a big gap there. And you haven't pressed in. Now, sometimes, you know, it's almost too late. It is never too late if we press in biblically to where we need to go. Please understand that. So when, it's, when, it's, when you feel like, hey, I'm left out of here, you probably are because you haven't made a point of being in there. And so men tend, during those early nurturing years, it's like, oh, that's so cute, and they'll play this and everything else, but they're not really investing. And the children, uh, Mom, I love you. Oh, you're so special. Here's my card I made for you, all these different things. And the connection now becomes more and more with the children and less and less um, with the spouse. So you've got to really be careful about that. You have to be careful 
as moms in particular, but also this part here, you initiate marriage moments. There is not one woman that I've ever met in all the counseling that we've done and probably through our name center that says, I don't care. I don't care if he, he cares about me or not. Yeah, in anger we may say that, but in reality, we want that relationship. And so believe it or not, one of the ways to make sure uh, we don't put our marriage on hold just to raise the kids is to make sure every day we make an investment into that, into that marriage. Every day. And we're married, we'll be married 41 years. Just two nights ago, we were sitting upstairs, just, I don't know, watching something I was reading. Phyllis was reading, watching the TV. How weird is that? And we're doing all at one time. And just in, as, as Phyllis will do many times, she'll just in the middle of anything, she'll go, I love you. And I've heard, as a man, it's like, what, what, what is that related to? Just, was that the show we were watching? Are you reading something? Because that is the last thing on my mind to say. Now, that's probably my problem more than anybody else's, but I just don't even think about that. But for a woman, it's always there. Now, I've learned over 41 years how to respond, not like, what? You know, you know saying I love you too is a very good response, you know. I don't need explanation. It's a very important part of keeping your marriage together as you're raising children. And it can be as simple as, you know, when again, you know, for some reason, for us as, as men, those early years are a little challenging. We're not really sure if we're going to break the kids or not, whatever it is. And so, but for you as a, as a mom, as a spouse, to be able to say, well, I really love the way you're working with the kids. I love the way that you're helping. Oh, thanks for spending the day with them. Thanks for taking them. Phyllis would always encourage me. I didn't need it to, to do it. But I would always, uh, I took every morning, uh, many of you know that from being in the class, every Monday, every, every day I had breakfast with the kids. While she got ready for work, I just had breakfast with the kids. That was, so Monday was always waffles, Tuesday was always eggs, Wednesday was cereal. I mean, of course, I had to have my structure, so we had to have it in there. Those are the best times our kids look back to, to this day. But it was, a, it was something that wor we worked out as a couple because I could say, well, you know, I would never say it, you know, well, I, I'm, I'm the man, I don't cook, you know, that's kind of odd. But I mean, the idea is she was getting, everybody understood what was going on. I was spending time with the kids, Phyllis was getting ready for work. When she was done, then I got, to, it just worked, you know. Again, the idea is make sure, no matter where you're at, no matter how many kids you have, that your your wife, your husband, know how important they are to you with or without kids. And then certainly within the context of it, to make sure they know, because we're all learning. If you have one kid, first time, learning. Second kid, not the same as the first kid, learning. Boys, girls, learning. Mixed families, stepkids, learning. We're all learning. There's no one here that says, oh yeah, we'll just do it like we did last time. We're trying to do that with the dog right now, believe me. It's not working the same way, so. And then openly love your spouse. Your children need to see a healthy relationship with their folks. Kids are secure and thus healthy when mom and dad set a marriage standard and relationship first. And we're so glad. I mean, that's something that I, I, we grew up, both Phyllis and I have legacies of parents that loved each other. Um, my in-laws were so demonstrative, it'd be like, oh, Dad, please stop. You know, my mother-in-law would just, she was a jokester, and she would just joke so much about loving my father-in-law. But I mean, they, that's how Phyllis grew up, and I grew up the same way. My folks, not so much demonstrative, but you know, they loved each other. Your kids need to know that you love each other, and that will impact, that will impact. So you can't just say, well, let's raise the kids, and when we're done, we'll get back to our relationship. No, it's got to be ongoing in light of raising your children. Openly love your spouse. You can kiss them. You can hug them. You can put your arms around them. You can tell them you love them. You know, uh, we have always said, I, I've, again, I've said before, we are a very thankful-oriented home. Everything is, we're always thankful, and our kids learn to do that, you know, growing up. So when, when dinner is done, not because out of habit, I just Hey, thanks, hon. That was delicious. You know, hey, thanks for cleaning up or thanks for the, whatever it is. It's just normal. And that part is when you openly are loving and respecting your spouse. Your kids need to hear it. You need to say it. And that keeps everything in the correct perspective. And then finally, never disrespect your spouse, especially in front of your children. There's a difference between 
Uh, male parenting and female parenting don't let the difference create a conflict. If you don't believe this, then look at a marriage, maybe your own, where you say as a husband or you as a wife are disrespecting your spouse on a regular basis and you're raising children. I will absolutely guarantee with 100% accuracy that the boy will begin to speak to his mother the way you're speaking to her. The girl will speak to her father the way you're speaking. Absolutely will happen. Absolutely. I've seen it so many times. Because when you're disrespectful, you're modeling, this is the way you talk to a woman, this is the way you talk to a man. That's what comes out. And, and that be, gets in there. So if you want your children not to run the show, make sure the show that they're watching is the right one, right? It's the correct thing that they see. So never disrespect. Respect is given and earned. Children need to learn how to respect, even in the difficult times. And that's where they really see it, when you really respect each other. And you're able to say, you know what, kids, we, uh, mom and dad, we're going to go for a walk. We're going to work. We're going to resolve some of these things, and we'll get back to you. Well, I need to know now. Johnny's picking me up in 10 minutes. Well, Johnny's going to have to wait because mom and I are going to work this out. Dad and I are going to work this out. Okay, very important that you respect each other and even respect the fact that we don't have all the answers. Very, very important part in terms of not empowering the children to run over the marriage. And then finally, and then I've got a quick finish up here. The closer you are as a couple, the less tension you will have with your children. Believe it or not, that is just that simple. Just that simple. Because you're learning about each other growing together. You're learning both about parenting and your marriage simultaneously. That is something that Phyllis and I found out. We were like, oh my goodness, this isn't just about parenting, marriage. It's all happening at the same time. You know, I watched how Phyllis loved the kids and did stuff. She watched as I did things. And, and our marriage began to get enriched because it was all happening. Because it's, it's one package. It's not like I said before, you know, raise the kids and then we'll get back to marriage. Put that on hold. Nah, it's all happening. You're learning about each other. And then at the end I wrote this. When it doesn't work out, make a point of working it out together. In other words, look at your personal values. Look at your personal history. Look at your personal fears your personal success, your personal failures, your personal gifts. Look at all of them and say, why? What's happening here? What, what's the conflict? Uh, when, when Phyllis was pregnant with Bradley, I was, I was very, and this is before you knew the sex, you was late. It was like, I, it looks like it might be, oh, that's, that's great. Now you can have parties over it because it's so accurate. Then they were not so accurate. It was mostly correct. And, and she said to me, um, and they, they thought we might be having a boy, and it didn't, I was so afraid. She goes, what is the matter? I said, you know what? I don't, I, don't, I don't play sports. I'm not really good at any of them, the ones that I do play. And I said, if we have a son, it's a, it'll be a disaster. It'll be a disaster. And I was so anxious about having a boy because of that reason. Well, by God's grace, you know, he put other people in my pathway. Phyllis taught him how to play football. Um, my nephew is a professional ball player. He taught him how to baseball. Uh, he played soccer here. We're still trying to figure out what he actually was doing on the field. It didn't matter. He had confidence because together we worked it out. You know, we realized, okay, here's my strengths. Here's my weaknesses. Together as a couple, we're going to work this out. We are not going to put what we, who we are on hold uh, for the sake of our children. Does that make sense? So, Again, these are all being videoed, so when at, we're all done, we'll put the package together. But uh, just today, as a, if you have children, older, younger, grandchildren, whatever it is, whatever, just pray together as a couple and say, God, just show us to be, have the best marriage for the sake of our children that we can have. And whatever God does, be ready for something powerful, because he has his heart for those children, but he has it through you in the oneness of you as a, as a married couple, all right? Let's pray together. Father, thank you that we are learning and growing in these truths. Thank you that, Lord, what you are doing in our lives is so much more powerful than we think we are doing. And so help us, Lord. You've given us these children. They will not define who we are, but you do. And we thank you in your name. Amen. Amen.